one person who everyone's complaining about, we can give everyone the bread and chuck them out for six weeks. And they would forget about them, and then the students would come back and things wouldn't be different, and then they would end up getting excluded anyway. So it was about building those partnerships with the schools and that real sort of partnership working, that we're working together to try and keep this young person with you. And therefore, the schools will come to the initial meeting, and the schools will also be part of the transition planning when that young person is going back again. So the initial assessment, as I said, parents, schools, and the leads from the centre will all meet, look at that young person's need, put together an individualised programme around what the school says, around what's going on at home, and then that joint reintegration planning and support. And quite often you can build networks within schools. So we had um, a group of young people who had been through the centre at different points in the year, and towards the end of the year the lead teacher went into the school and did a circle time and created a network of support with those young people, so the year 10s and the year 11s who had been to the centre and they managed to keep themselves in mainstream schools, began mentoring the younger students who had also been off site or <coughs> and tried to support them staying in. So it really is about that partnership working and not getting the schools on site so that everyone's working together and creating those networks. So that's what our managed intervention looks like, if you like. It's time limited. And that's one of the most important things. We use personalised planning. Again, that comes from the initial meeting with parents and <coughs> schools. Flexible curriculum. Sometimes it's because a young person may, be, may have fallen behind, may have gone on holiday or something, and then when they come back, they're, um, they're out of date with their coursework and they just don't think they can catch up and so they're quite sort of disillusioned. So they can come with really set pieces of work that they need to complete in their time there. We use e-monitoring to track their progress. There's a really clear reward system so <coughs> at the sort of teenage brain and that immediate gratification and for trying to kind of almost retrain these young people to realise that they can get that attention from positive feedback and from support. Academic mentoring, so looking at are there patterns in terms of subjects at school, is there something that can be put in place because of, of a specific subject? We had a classic case recently with a young person and the teacher did a diagram on the board and the diagram just looked really simple, three boxes like that with arrows between them and there was text, there was text in each box. And the young person sort of diligently took the ruler and was copying and when she looked at his book she recognised that what he had copied looked like this. And she thought, well, that's interesting, because he's tried. It's not like he's sort of saying, I'm not bothered with this, but it's very different to what was asked of him. Um, and so she got an educational psychologist to come in and do, a, do an assessment, and obviously had the time and the flexibility to do that, and discovered that this young man had real issues with his visuospatial processing, I think she said it was. Um, and then when she looked back at the data from school, she recognised that subjects like math and DT, where the students would be encouraged, would be um, asked to do things like this, to draw graphs, or to sort of take data from one thing and turn it into another, there was a real pattern in terms of them kicking off and getting into trouble. And the relationships with teachers had then broken down, and it was this cycle. And just by, by being able to pass this information on to his teachers, be aware this is something that he struggles with. He may not be able to do this. If you ask him to do a task similar to this, he is going to struggle. And the likelihood is he's not going to say, I can't do this or I find this difficult. He's going to rip it up or storm out. But having that knowledge empowered the teachers to be able to see what was behind the behaviour rather than just focusing on the behaviour. So that holistic assessment that I've spoken about, the family support, and that's another huge part of it. Again, linking up talking to the family, having that time out of the school to speak to the families and find out what's going on at home, linking up the partnerships so that everyone's working together, and highly trained learning support professionals, which I'm sure is something that Jamie spoke about earlier, in terms of skilling up the learning support professionals to notice things like this, and to be specialists in certain areas, such as speech and language, so that they can support as well. Any questions? Okay, so one of the things that is sort of linked into this is to do with teenagers and how 
how their brain develops and how their brain works. Um, and I was just going to show a very short clip here, which I think is relevant to the discussion around the teenage brain and the fact that it is constantly developing. And I think that that really creates an opportunity for us as professionals in working with these young people in understanding that because the brain is constantly changing, because we aren't as locked as we are, because kids aren't as locked as we are as adults, there's an opportunity to really influence their behaviour and to support them in making better choices. Because often the reasons that young people are referred are because of the impulsive behaviour which is directly linked to this. So I'll just show you a clip of this. And then any questions and discussion, then we'll have a look at some of the case studies. How does the teenage brain make decisions? One of the first discoveries um, relevant to this uh, topic was made when we discovered um, that the part of your brain in the very front, called the prefrontal cortex, which is the last brain region to develop, because your brain develops from the back to the front, um, continues to change up until the mid-20s. And the reason this is relevant is because the prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that helps you think about the consequences or potential consequences of your actions before you do them. It helps you regulate your behavior and your emotions. And so it makes sense that if this part of the brain isn't fully available until well past adolescence, then teenagers may make more impulsive decisions with less regard for the potential future consequences. But we now know that the story is far more interesting and complicated than that. And in fact, what we really need to do is think about um, how brain regions that are not at the surface of the brain, <coughs> but in the deeper layers, how they change. And one region we focus on is called the striatum. And the striatum is the key component of the reward system. So when you receive something that you find rewarding, your striatum is very responsive, and it releases the <coughs> And this is the case not just in humans, but in kids, in, in mice, in, in rats, in monkeys. All of these organisms respond really with a lot of excitement in their brain when they get something they like. So in my lab, we, we study this, this reward system across development, and especially in teenagers. And we do that by asking people to come to the laboratory and perform what's called a, a functional magnetic resonance imaging scan, or fMRI. And the beauty of fMRI is that you can take a snapshot of the brain in motion. So while you are experiencing something you like, or while you are making a decision, we capture how your brain is responding to that, how your brain is active. And um, so to study the reward system, what we did is not simply 